and welcome to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. Today is Friday, July 8th. I'm Melody Rose, President of City Club, and I'm very pleased to have you with us today. Both the members and guests who join us here at the Governor Hotel and those of you listening on OPB or KBPS radio or watching on Portland Community Media City Net 30. Today we are delighted to welcome Governor Barbara Roberts, Oregon's first female governor, who will speak with us about the past century of women's suffrage in Oregon. But before our program begins, we have just a few announcements. To begin, out of respect to our guests and speakers and listeners, please silence your cell phones. Next, I'd like to give a warm City Club welcome to our new City Club members and, uh, and organizations. Do we have any new members today? Please stand, if so. Welcome. Welcome. City Club's corporate and media sponsors are essential to the vitality and sustainability of this club that we love and to our many activities. I'd like to thank our generous media sponsors, including Oregon Business Magazine, and to offer our deep appreciation to the Friday Forum corporate sponsors. Please join me in thanking communications firm Morell Inc., utility company Northwest Natural, and the law firms of Perkins Cooey and Schwabi Williamson Wyatt. We are grateful for your support and your ongoing commitment to the club. And if your company or firm would like to support the club's mission through sponsorship, please contact our friendly City Club staff at the back of the room or call the City Club offices. Today, in addition to taking our usual member questions from the microphone, we'll be taking index card questions during the question and answer period. During the forum, we invite you to write any questions that come to mind for our speaker on the index cards which are on all of your tables. You do not need to be a City Club member uh, to ask a question in this way. During the board host question, City Club staff will collect the index cards and pick the best question, which I will read from the microphone. City Club members are still welcome to come to the microphone to ask their questions during the Q&A. We are sure that you will come up with some great questions for the governor. And now to our program. It took 42 years and five unsuccessful campaigns before women in Oregon achieved the right to vote in 1912. Next year, Oregon will commemorate the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage in our state. Today, Governor Barbara Roberts will recount a critical piece of Oregon history, the story of the campaign for Oregon women's right to vote. She will also offer her observations on Oregon women's political activity in the state, their growing electoral successes and expanded public leadership and their ongoing challenges and obstacles. Barbara Roberts was elected governor in 1990, becoming not only the first female governor of our own state, but also one of the first 10 female governors across the country. Upon leaving office in January 1995, the governor's record included, included Oregon's lowest unemployment rate in 25 years, the highest economic investment in the state's history, and the highest housing starts in 15 years, which included thousands of new affordable housing units. She also led efforts to secure state funding for the West Side Light Rail and to begin preparing for the North-South lines. Following her time as governor, Roberts held the position at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government for four years, where she served as the director of state and local government executive programs. She was also a senior fellow at the Harvard Women and Public Policy Program. Roberts returned to her beloved Oregon in 1998, taking a position at Portland State University's Hatfield School of Government, serving for five years there as the Associate Director of Leadership until her so-called retirement in 2005. Earlier this year, 
Roberts came out of retirement and was appointed to fill a vacancy on the Metro Council, a post she will hold through 2012. I also must add on a personal note that I've worked with Roberts this year as she has completed her memoir, which will come out in publication in October of this year, and it will be the third only such memoir of a female governor in our nation's history, something I think we can all really look forward to. So without further ado, please help me welcome the Honorable Governor Barbara Roberts. Thank you so much, Melody, and thank you. Um, it feels a little like coming home to be back here, remembering back to so many times on your podium, speeches and political debates, even a state of the state address while I was governor. This was always one of my favorite audiences, well-informed, attentive, and thoughtful. While I was researching my new book that Melody just member, uh, mentioned and the 1990 campaign for governor, I came across an entertaining newspaper story about the City Club. The Oregonian of October 6th of that year explained that a standing room only crowd had been there on that Friday's debate. The cameras had been there, the reporters were there. However, my opponent had declined to participate in the debate. The Oregonian commented in print, quote, the friendly city club members served up a few softball questions that Roberts obligingly knocked out of the ballroom of the Hilton Hotel. <laughs> so is, it is good to be back. Next year, Oregon will celebrate the century anniversary of our state's women gaining the right to vote. I could simply acknowledge that historic landmark of 2012 and move on to what some would consider more current, perhaps more significant events. But the story of women's suffrage in Oregon was an effort, a campaign that spanned more than four decades and reached the state ballot six times before it was successful. It divided some families, frustrated the legislature, filled hundreds of pages of newspapers, mobilized women of every economic, social, religious, and racial stripe, and eventually took advantage of Oregon's newly approved 1902 initiative petition law. This is a chapter of Oregon's history worth our time to both hear and to appreciate. And in recounting this story, you will come to realize that the battle for the franchise for women in the western part of this nation came far earlier and with much more success than in other parts of this country. And that would help you, I hope, consider that this speaks not only to this piece of history, but I would contend that it reflects much more about the women of the West that may explain not only who we were 100 years ago, but who we are, in fact, today. The first real inkling of Oregon women's desire to vote was evidenced even before statehood. When the Oregon Constitutional Convention met in the late summer of 1857, one of the 60 elected delegates, one from Multnomah County, move that the word male be stricken from the designation of voting citizens. The motion failed, but the stage was set. The dream had at least been verbalized. When Oregon achieved statehood in 1859, our new constitution unfortunately withheld the voting franchise from women and from men of color, from Chinese Americans, and those of mixed heritage. My great-great-grandmother, who walked across this country on the Oregon Trail, who had suffered the loss of a child from yellow fever on that arduous journey, who had bore my family's first Oregon-born child on January 1, 1854, and had, in fact, helped her husband carve a farm out of the wilderness of the Roseburg area, Almeda Barney Boggs, had not earned her right to vote in this so-called new Eden of the West. 
Then, at the insistence of the Oregon's early suffragists, beginning in 1870, the issue came before both the 1872 and the 1874 legislative sessions. It was debated by those all-male bodies, but the measure failed to receive a referral to the ballot. Then in 1880 and 18, 1882, the then required two legislative session passage, you had to get it through two sessions in a row, for all the constitutional amendments at that time was successful and the measure was referred to the November 1884 ballot. Oregon's all male electorate soundly rejected the constitutional referral giving it only a 28% approval. A decade later, Abigail Scott Dunaway and her fellow suffragists were back again. Abigail was no quitter. She and her family had arrived on the Oregon Trail in 1852 with her eight siblings. She knew about tough journeys, and she fully intended to vote and to vote in Oregon. The voting franchise bill for women successfully passed the 1895 session, but unfortunately, since disputes kept the 1897 House from organizing and no business was considered that year, the 1895 bill was held over until 1899 where it passed and once again was referred to the ballot in 1900 and once again failed. However, in the 16 year interim between 1884 and 1900, support for women's right to vote had grown from 28% to a near successful 48%. It was not the time to give up on this already 30 year effort. Now, let me pause and set this historic campaign in the context of the time. By 1900, four Western states had already given women voting rights. Wyoming in 1890, Colorado in 1893, and Utah and Idaho in 1896. The work to secure the vote for Oregon women was well, not what we would think of today as a so-called Oregon first, like the bottle bill and statewide land use and death with dignity. We were early nationally but not in the vanguard in the Western states. Then following the 1900 ballot defeat, a real Oregon first, a real Oregon first changed the strategy and the future of women's suffrage. With the success of the legislatively referred ballot measure that created Oregon's initiative petition process in 1902, the Oregon women's movement had a new tool progressive political activist William Uran and his direct legislation league had handed a new political option to Oregon citizens and a potential new path for giving Oregon women equal access to the vote. But it soon became clear that this new pathway was not a panacea to the long denied hopes for the women's vote in Oregon. The first initiative measure failed in 1906 with 44% approval. It lost again in 1908 with only 39% of the vote and it gained only 37% of the vote in 1910. The issue was going steadily downhill in Oregon. Yet the state of Washington had been successful at the ballot, ballot in 1910 and California was approaching a 1911 vote that was gaining very strong support. What was the problem in Oregon? Well, it became clear that the more passive campaign style, which Abigail Scott Dunaway had led and even described as the still hunt, S-T-I-L-L, -L, still hunt, was not adequate for the early decades of the 1900s. Abigail favored in fact, insisted upon using behind the scenes work among elite male leaders, avoiding public debate and demonstrations of support. Abigail Scott Dunaway also objected to leaders from the national suffragist movement coming into Oregon with their activist strategies. 
She blamed them for the 1906 defeat. These conflicts caused a drop-off from the local supporters in 1908 and then again in the 1910 campaign. The loss of support for Dunaway's political direction was evident following the huge defeat of the 1910 ballot measure. But Abigail was not deterred. She was stubborn and she was strong and she was a leader. Let me demonstrate to you her leadership and commitment even under growing unrest in Oregon's suffrage movement with her direction for the next campaign. In a 2007 Oregon Historical Society Quarterly, Professor Kimberly Jensen from the History Department and Gender Studies programs at Western Oregon University relates the 1910 and 11 sequence of leadership taken by Abigail Scott Dunaway. Let me quote from Professor Jensen's article. Abigail Scott Dunaway prepared early for the 1912 campaign. As president of the Oregon Equal Suffrage Association, she directed personally the petition drive that secured the required number of signatures for an equal suffrage measure to reach the 1912 ballot. She had the needed signatures by December of 1910, two years, almost two years in advance. Then in January of 1911, Dunaway and her association passed a resolution appealing to the Oregon legislature to support the new initiative. She presented the memorial of support in person to the Oregon House and then to the Oregon Senate, and they passed their recommendation of support in February of 1911. So we haven't even reached the 20, uh, the 1912 measure, and she's already got the signatures, and she's got the legislature support. So the stage was set. The stage was set for the work to begin. Many women urged Dunaway to please begin an active campaign, but she once again opted to wait, preferring her strategy of working privately. Once again, the ballot measure might have gone down to defeat if it were not for several unexpected factors. First, Abigail Scott Dunaway became ill and was confined to her bed for most of the 1912 campaign. At age 77, she tried to reach it, regain control of the campaign, but failed. Anna Shaw from the National Women's Suffrage Association wrote to Oregon's campaign leaders saying, quote, Mrs. Dunaway should bear the burden of glory and credit if she will only give us a chance to work, unquote. Shaw further re reinforced the importance of respect toward Dunaway when she wrote, Whenever it is possible to cooperate with Mrs. Dunaway, do so. Show her any courtesy you can. Put on her brow a halo, a laurel wreath, even an eagle's plume. <laughs> but keep the dues money to do the campaign work. <laughs> a practical political leader. At this point in history, Dr. Esther Pohl Lovejoy returned to Oregon from her advanced medical studies in Vienna. A longtime supporter of women's right to vote, she arrived just as the 1912 election campaign was beginning. So she pledged to give her considerable skills to the part-time oversight of the Oregon campaign on top of the responsibilities for her medical practice. She kept that pledge. She assembled a team of women leaders and the 1912 campaign took on a new look, a new strategy, a new activism, and created one of the strongest political coalitions Oregon had ever witnessed. Pro-suffrage groups blossomed across Oregon, stronger, larger, and more diverse than in any previous effort. The Men's Equal Suffrage Club of Multnomah County the Colored Women's Equal Suffrage Association, Stenographers Equal Suffrage League, the Quakers Equal Suffrage Society, the Chinese American Equal Suffrage Society, Business Women's Suffrage League, and the Boys Booster Club. <laughs> Endorsements grew by the day. Central Labor Council, Oregon State Grange, Oregon Women's Press Club, the Women's Christian Temperance Union. By the way, that was because they thought women's vote would take away the sale of liquor. 
the Socialist Party, the Oregon Civic League, and Governor Oswald West. Now, I stop here to tell you that the support of Governor Oz West for the 1912 initiative brought with it another interesting side story that attracted statewide press. In a July 1912 story in the Medford Mail Tribune entitled, Miss Hobbs Spurns Votes for Women, the Medford paper reported that Fern Hobbs, chief clerk to state government, had not followed the lead of her boss, Governor West. She declared her opposition to the universal franchise and said she hoped the time would never come when women were unable to vote. She was quoted in the article, quote, I would just dread such a time, and wouldn't I look nice as a candidate for governor? No, no, we women have troubles enough without worrying over politics. But other endorsements came in from the national suffrage groups and leaders of the western states where women had already won the vote. It was evident that this was no longer a behind the scenes campaign effort. The coalition of women's suffrage groups had an inventory of 165,000 pieces of literature. Now think about the population then, that's a lot of literature. They had 50,000 vote for women buttons. They had banners and flags. They passed out brochures on street corners under posters that read, Oregon Next. They rode and walked in parades. They did a rally in Pendleton during the roundup. <laughs> I would have liked to have seen that. They presented a 12-foot high green vote for women sign in the St. Patrick's Day Parade. They arranged for a giant votes for women sign on the left field fence of the new Portland baseball grounds for the opening game of the Pacific Coast League. They gathered 10,000 people for speeches in Oaks Amusement Park. They sent out weekly press releases to every newspaper in Oregon. The Oregon Journal created a regular column called What Suffragists Are Doing. Reading about it now reminds me of Susan B. Anthony's famous slogan, never another season of silence. Nothing about this campaign was silent. Nothing about this campaign could have been further from Dunaway's philosophy and style of achieving the needed votes. It was a campaign worthy of success, even in today's modern political climate. And it worked. In November of 1912, the Initiative for Women's Vote in Oregon passed with a 52% margin. After 40 years and six ballot measures, Oregon women were voting citizens. For yeah. For Esther Paul Lovejoy, both a brilliant campaign leader and an avid believer in the women's vote, one of the most significant factors in the victory was that between 1910 and 1912, the suffragist coalition, their strategy and their hard work had moved a loss with only 37% support to a vote and a win with 52% in favor. Dr. Lovejoy recognized what was possible with the positive application of the new Oregon initiative system if coalitions worked together, organized, traveled statewide, and applied modern strategies to campaigning. She thought, just think what would be possible once the women's vote was added to that formula. So as we approach year 2012, we have strong reason to recognize a century milestone in Oregon and preparations are underway to do exactly that. The major celebration for this historical landmark flies under the banner, a century of action, Oregon women's vote. And these are the back of the room, I hope you'll pick one up. It was conceived by history professionals who recognized that women are largely absent from accounts of our state's past, masking women's broad, sustained, and diverse influences 
on the state we know today. There's already an extensive and growing website funded by the Oregon Heritage Commission and matching funds. It houses essays by noted historians, scans newspaper articles from both the 1906 and the 1912 campaigns, and information about women's archival collections across the state. This amazing website can be found at www.centuryofaction, all one word, centuryofaction.org. Century of Action is organizing programs and events, including reenactment debates in commemoration of our suffrage centennial. And I would ask that you don't miss the new 2011-2012 Oregon Blue Book with colored photos for, of the campaign for women's right to vote in Oregon. Secretary of State Kate Brown assembled a wonderful pictorial of that history in the very center of the Oregon Blue Book, we have made the centerfold. <laughs> I have been excited and honored to play a part in this planning, along with Norma Paulus and the late Judge Betty Roberts. So watch the website for exciting events and lectures and special celebrations as we unfold the history of a century of action. So let me go national now for a couple of minutes. Last October, in Philadelphia, 116 women from every state in the nation, following the model of the Congressional Congress, gathered for three days just two blocks from where 56 men signed the Declaration of Independence. This time, 116 women signed the Declaration of Equality. Thus began Vision 2020, the nation's recognition of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution women's right to vote, and the yet unfinished work of the suffragists of 1920. Vision 2020 plans a decade-long action agenda to move America toward equality by inspiring and engaging new generations of women and men to work toward social and economic justice across America. I was thrilled to be one of the 116 women in Philadelphia who put pen to paper in the name of the past and in hopes for a future of equality and full in inclusion. I'm now serving on the leadership circle for Vision 2020 and look forward to reporting back to Oregon as we move forward with that work. But obviously, women's history goes well beyond the right to vote in America and here in Oregon. Significant contributions by women impacted the Oregon Territory long before the campaigns for suffrage. Looking back in Oregon history, among Oregon tribes, for instance, it was their women who were the storytellers most often who passed on the centuries-old tales of their people and their lands. In more modern times, tribal women have often been the only remaining speakers of their tribe's native tongues, and they have taught young tribal members those languages to make certain they were not lost forever. And we have seen more and more Oregon tribal women rise to leadership as tribal chiefs among the Grand Round and the Cow Creeks and other tribes in Oregon. Those of us who grew up in Oregon know the stories and the legends of Sacagawea, we may have called her Sacagawea, but correctly, Sacagawea, who acted as a guide to Lewis and Clark as they first explored the great Northwest. Without her knowledge of the land and the pathways and the tribes, the Lewis and Clark exploration might be barely a footnote in history. The next wave of women into the West transformed this region in ways that still impact us today, the women of the Oregon Trail. Those pioneers were visionary enough and determined enough to leave everything they had known to venture into an unknown territory and an unknown new life. The diaries of those difficult treks across the continent were almost entirely written by the women and teenage girls of those wagon trains. They recorded the challenges, the bursts, the deaths, the changing scenery, the hardships, and the hopes. They preserved that history for all the generations to follow. And then once those wagon trains arrived in Oregon, the women of the trail made huge contributions 
They were most often the ones who founded the first schools and churches, the first orphanages and libraries and many of the small businesses. And they worked side by side with their men to establish farms, as I said, out of the wilderness. These Western women were more equal partners than their sisters in the East and the South. Perhaps that accounts for all the early votes in Western states to give women the vote. They were more equal partners. And thanks to many women, thanks to many women who carried our water from the Oregon Trail to the Oregon present, we now have opportunities that lay before us, much like the vast lands that faced the pioneer women as they walked across this country to the American West. And now today, every place you look in our state, Oregon women are making history and changing history. And that is particularly true in the arena of politics, electoral positions, where the vote counts. Women are in decision-making roles at every level of government, school boards, local governments, the state legislature, and the judiciary. It seems accurate to say that in the 99 years since Oregon women won the vote, we have in fact literally witnessed a political revolution. We are at the table and we are changing the menu. But I hesitate celebrating these electoral gains without first acknowledging some of the sacrifices that early, earlier women made, the cost of later political victories. In Oregon, two viable women, experienced and capable, Betty Roberts and Norma Paulus, ran for governor and lost. Two women ran for the U.S. Senate and lost. A 100% qualified woman ran for state treasurer, Jewel Lansing, and lost. Women ran for Congress in Oregon and lost. But one painful brick after another, they laid the path that helped me and other women win. In Oregon, we now had a female U.S. Senator, three women in Congress, a woman state labor commissioner, two women state superintendents of public instruction, three female secretaries of state, four women on her state Supreme Court bench, three women mayors of Portland, four women speakers of the Oregon House, a woman mayor of every one of Oregon's 10 largest cities, three women on Oregon's federal bench, and I have had the honor to serve as our state's governor. More, thank you. <laughs> more and more bricks, a longer and longer path for women to follow. And before you know it, it is no longer simply a path. It is a solid foundation on which new women leaders may stand tall. It is now impossible to put Jeannie back in the bottle. It is no longer simply our history. It is our future. But I would be remiss if I didn't comment on some of the work yet to be done, yet to be achieved. For instance, there has never been a woman president in the Oregon State Senate. Politically skilled, highly prepared, articulate, experienced women have served in that body. Betty Roberts, Jane Cease, Betsy Johnson, Kate Brown, Nancy Riles, Jenny Burdick, Joyce Cohen, Susan Bonamici, to name a few, yet none have presided as president of the Senate right to date. We have never elected a woman to be state treasurer or to serve as our state's attorney general. A woman has never presided over our state Supreme Court. We still have political ladders to climb. But I have shared these remarks today is part of a goal of Oregon's century of action to become informed about the deep and broad history of women's leadership in Oregon. The more we learn about history and the more we share it with our children and grandchildren, the more successes will come to deserving women leaders. On corporate boards and academic settings, in the arts, on the ballot, we will begin to recognize that these historical foundations impact future leadership choices. And let me add a strong personal opinion here. Role models matter. Let me give you an example. 
I look at my granddaughters and think what they see in the way of role models, even in the women in our family. One of my granddaughters has a mother who is a professional chef. Five of my granddaughters have a mother who is a judge. One of my granddaughters has a mother who has held statewide office, and all of them have a grandmother who has been governor. <laughs> when I compare that view of the world to my own as a girl, it is oceans apart. As a young girl growing up in small town Oregon, I had no important women role models to follow, no women mayors or county commissioners, no women legislators or school principals, no women ministers or women business owners. But I remember earning a Girl Scout badge for women's history. And I learned about Helen Keller and Madame Curie and Clara Barton and Joan of Arc and Eleanor Roosevelt and Susan B. Anthony and Amelia Earhart. Now those were women who gave girls of the 1940s and 1950s new ideas to dream about, new possibilities. I did a special ceremony in the state capitol two weeks ago for Girl Scouts from across Oregon who had completed their work for the Girl Scout Gold Award, the equivalent to the Boy Scouts Eagle Award. I reminded the girls and their families that I was the only Girl Scout, former Girl Scout, to have been an Oregon governor. <laughs> Gotta think about that a minute, don't you? <laughs> Role models matter. History matters. It is important we capture that history for future times, much as the Oregon Trail Diaries gave us first-person accounts of that long-ago historical journey. And in a sense, I have been on just such an historical journey for the past five and a half years as I undertook a project only a few women political leaders in our country have completed. I decided to write an autobiography, one that included my four years as Oregon's governor. At that time, Governor Madeline Cunin of Vermont was the only female governor in our country to have put her story pen to paper. Her story, her book, Living a Political Life, was published in 1994. A decade later, no other woman governor had told her story. Ann Richards of Texas had completed an autobiography late in her term as state treasurer, but it did not give the reader her experiences as a woman governor. As a, one of America's first 10 women governors, I became alarmed that our place in history was going to be unrecorded told perhaps by others, but not by the women who politically pioneered those positions. Several of these women governors can no longer share their personal perspective on being governor. Four of the first 10 women governors elected in their own right are deceased. Ella Grasso of Connecticut, Dixie Lee Ray of Washington, Joan Finney of Kansas, and Ann Richards of Texas. This history needs to be told, not just a brief memoir, but a life story like Governor Kunin's that would help a reader see that path that takes a little girl from dolls and tea sets to the office of governor. I begin to feel a need and obligation to tell my story, to share a piece of the puzzle that helps complete the picture of America's early women governors. And so I began writing my family, my childhood, my youth, my marriage, the birth of my two sons, the end of my 16-year marriage, my struggles as a single parent. Month after month I wrote and I recalled and I relived those early year, years of my life. Then I retold the 1971 life-changing story of becoming an unpaid citizen advocate for special needs children in the Oregon legislature, which was the catalyst for my long political career. Chapter after chapter, I wrote. I researched newspapers, the Oregon archives records, school records, legislative papers, family documents. My memories became a manuscript. I started with the idea that this book would be a cinch. After all, I was there for every day of my life. <laughs> all I had to do was put it on paper. Well, surprise, about four years later, I recognized I have been traveling an emotional road, unpacking the boxes of my life. I had become part storyteller and part self-therapist. So I find myself at the near end, the very late stage of this literary journey. 
I have a beautiful new book cover, a completed manuscript edited with photos. The OSU Press Fall Catalog features my book, and in October, Up the Capitol Steps will be released. At this point in time, my new book will become one of three autobiographies written by women governors in America, Governor Madeline Cunin's book, Governor Sarah Palin's book, <laughs> and mine. <laughs> A small number of life stories to record the history of some of our nation's most early women political pioneers. And just as I have told my part of the American Women's Historical Saga, the Century of Action Committee and their fascinating website are preparing every day to share that voting rights story with our viewers, photographs, newspaper articles, research, calendar events. It will all be there for you to read and learn and appreciate. I have read Governor Cunin's book twice. I have indeed read Governor Palin's book. I read the wonderful books of Ann Richards and Hillary Clinton and Betty Roberts, and I'm just preparing to read Avail Gordley's new book. History is meant not to sit on a shelf, but to devour and think about and talk about and share. The wonderful publications currently being released by the OSU Press, and with the strong support of PSU's Women's Center and Melody Rose, in moving these stories forward will soon mean that Oregon will have the strongest collection of women leaders' books in any state in this nation. We are bring, bringing our place in history out of the shadows. And again, I am reminded of Susan B. Anthony's strong declaration, never another season of silence. So just as Oregon's tribal women are preserving their native tongues, as the women and girls of the Oregon Trail gave permanent voice to their place in history, as the w Oregon women of 100 years ago gave both voice and vote to women for an entire century, just as the voices and protests by women resulted in extending full membership to women in this city club, the Century of Action celebration will bring to light a piece of Oregon history little told and highly underappreciated. Well, that is about to change. And this enlightenment will bring, become the catalyst for inspiring women's rightful place in the Oregon story. Names like Abigail Scott Dunaway and Dr. Esther Poole Lovejoy and Hattie Raymond and Elizabeth Eggert and Grace Watt Rose will become familiar in our libraries and classrooms as we study this history of suffrage. That history will be followed, I hope and believe, by new historical knowledge of women like Marie Newberg and Edith Green and Darlene Hooley and Gretchen Kapori and Margaret Carter and Bev Clarno and Judge Betty Roberts and Gladys McCoy and Nan Honeyman and Mildred Schwab and Vera Katz and Judge Mercedes Diaz and Susan Castile and Mary Wendy Roberts and Nancy Fadley and Norma Paulus and Ruth McFarland and Mary Alice Ford and Judge Ann Aiken and Jackie Winters and Nancy Riles, they'll all be there and many more. And they will become part in telling our story, our history here in Oregon. And when that history is finally recorded, when the work and the sacrifice and leadership of these women is made clear, our state's motto will carry a new and proud meaning. She flies with her own wings. Try following that. 
Before I introduce our Friday Forum host, if you have a, written a question on an index card on your table, now is the time to hold it up so our City Club staff can circulate around and pick it up from you. The first question for our speaker today, as always, will be from our Friday Forum host. This time, City Club immediate past president, Sharon Van Sickle Robbins. Doesn't she look more relaxed? <laughs> <laughs> Sharon operates a cut flower business with 20,000 peony plants on Sovi Island. She's been a City Club member since 1996 and has chaired the club's Business Environment Study Committee among many other forms of service at the club. Sharon. Thank you, Governor Roberts, for the inspiration. I feel so ready for the weekend now. Um, you spoke compellingly of the importance of history, and I know that there are a lot of moms of teenage daughters here, and there are some teenage daughters here today. Um, but I know last year, when my daughter was doing American history, there wasn't enough time in the schedule for women's suffrage to be covered, so she skipped over that. And I'm just wondering what kinds of things, with all of the history that your book and others are putting out there into the world, how do we make sure that these stories are being told in the schools and that our daughters are getting this information in their history classes? That may be another softball from the <laughs> City Club. First of all, obviously, we have a lot of women serving in both parties, in both houses in the Oregon legislature. And with the new educational changes in Oregon, I would hope that our governor and the legislature would begin to understand that there is a hole in women's history in Oregon, including the issue of suffrage. Um, I am appalled sometimes. In fact, until my book comes out, and Madeline Kunin's book has not been in print for many years. If a young woman went into a library in this county and asked for an autobiography by a woman governor, the only one that would be there would have been Sarah Palin's. And I'm hopeful that one of the things we do is with these new books coming out, Betty Roberts' book, Avail Gordley's book, mine, others that are coming, that we will begin to create an interest in women's history. And I believe the celebration uh, for the century of women voting in Oregon is an opportunity to expand the interest in that. But it, it is amazing to me to pick up a history book and read, and it says there were no women on the Oregon Trail, you know, and there were no women any place. And I mean, I don't know how this country did so well with none of us there, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and if you think about what that means, if I'm a young woman and I pick up a history book, most likely, most likely published in Texas, by the way, that's where most history books are published, most written by, when, um, by men, it's changing a little, and the one thing you will notice about a history book, it has almost no women in it, and it doesn't hardly talk about the western part of the United States. All history occurred with men on the East Coast. And, um, and it, it is abysmal, it is abysmal, that treatment of history that leaves out women, leaves out the West, and leaves young women thinking that, we, that they are not part of this, that they don't have an opportunity. So I think of two or three things really quickly I want to say. The Walk of the Heroines at Portland State, if you have not been down there to look at what we have done in this community to capture the history of family and women of all kinds in all centuries, you need to see that. The new archives at, Port at Portland State University, women's archives capturing the papers and history of women who have served in this state, I think we are beginning to pay attention and I think the next place we need to pay attention is to ask the governor and the legislature to respond to this need. We'll now take questions from the floor. As always, members are invited to the microphone to ask their questions. Asking questions at the Friday Forum microphone is a privilege of City Club membership. 
So before asking your question, please identify yourself as a City Club member and ask your question in 30 seconds or less. If I flash this, it means you need to wrap up your question. Uh, also, I will make time to make sure that we read a couple of audience index cards. Thank you. Um, I'm Joyce DeMonin, City Club member. Thank you, Governor Roberts, for a great speech. Today, I brought my 14-year-old niece with me who's entering Century High School in Hillsboro. And I would just like you to offer her any advice for her new career in high school. And as a leader in Oregon, she, like you, is a descendant of Oregon pioneers. Wow. Giving, adv <laughs> giving advice is always frightening. Um, <laughs> there are two organizations represented here today that I hope your niece will keep her eye on for future activity. Uh, sitting at the Portland State University table are the young women from Emerge Oregon. I am honored to sit on their advisory committee. They are encouraging women to learn about politics and government and be active. And there are also people here from New Leadership Oregon. Where's the New Leadership? Oh, this is New, okay, that's New Leadership Oregon. Where's the Emerge table? I got them backwards, back there. And those two organizations in Oregon, um, new, I'm sorry, I, I did that re in reverse, but New Leadership Oregon, I served as chair of that when it first started for three years. And it is bringing young women, college women from all over the state from different colleges to spend a week at Portland State. I'm honored every year to be with them at the Capitol when they spend a day at the Capitol and they are studying policy issues. So those kinds of organizations are happening and we need to encourage young women to be politically active. And I just would like to say 2012 is an election year and what a good opportunity to be a volunteer on a campaign for a candidate that your niece and other young women are supportive of. Hi, Governor Roberts. Uh, Stephanie Vardavis. I'm a City Club member, and I would like you to say a little bit more about what women who are a little bit older than the younger women that we hope will really be coming into their own soon as Oregon leaders, what can we do in a material way to really help support, encourage them, and help them reach their potential? Well, the first thing I would say is I'm a strong believer in mentoring. I believe that the knowledge base in this room alone and groups like the Oregon Women's Forum who are mentoring women now, I believe we can step forward and give them support and knowledge and, and give them the kind of interest that we already have and get them to feel that same interest. So mentoring matters, and I think clearly there are organizations doing work where the financial support we as mature women can sometimes offer to those organizations while they help women, younger women many times, to move forward into more active leadership is another place that we can help out. And so we, I think the opportunities are many for those of us. And I would remind you that older, mature women can run for public office. <laughs> Leslie Moorhead, City Club member. Uh, Governor Roberts, I want to ask a quasi-political question. Um, in today's political climate, do you think there's any issue or what would be the top issue that most women would support, whether it's an issue that we would vote on or basically an issue of public policy that, that people could agree on? What would women be primarily, what's the most likely one that most women would support? The other part of that question is, is there an issue that women would support predominantly, and that men would not. That may depend on the state you're in. Um, the men of Oregon for many years, I think, have been very supportive of women's issues and have been teammates and soulmates with us in moving forward on women's issues. I think if I had to pick an issue that I think would mobilize the most women the majority of women by far, it would be issues of choice. I think clearly in this state and nationally, the polling still indicates the strong support women have for choice and choice issues and family planning. 
I believe those are still issues that are at the top of the agenda for many women. And with the current threats in many states and nationally to that agenda, I think that is one of the places that women would be very strong. I can't tell you the difference in where men and women in Oregon would be on, on policy issues. I think there's as many caring, concerned men about mental health and children and early childhood education as there are women. So I don't think it's gender oriented. I think sometimes I tell men it's when they get daughters and granddaughters that they become much more aware of why things like childcare are important. So one from the tables here. Um, what is the biggest challenge facing young women today and how do we overcome that challenge? I think the biggest ch challenge may be to have an affordable education that allows you to be educated and prepare for leadership. The cost of education has grown so expensive. The, the student loans that people are having at the end of their college career, it discourages many young women from finishing college or even starting college. I think that educational issue is one that is a deterrent to many young women. Now, as a woman who does not have a college degree, I do not believe it is a requirement for everyone, but that is not an indication that I have not been a lifelong learner and it would have been much easier for me to do what I did if I had approached it with a finished college education, even an extended education. So I think that's the strongest deterrent for young women today is to be able to get that preparation. Uh, Kurt Wavering, a male member. Um, <laughs> um, I have not heard you mention a subject that um, I'm interested in because I serve on the board of a domestic violence shelter. And I'm wondering what your uh, sense is of what frontiers we have to work on um, to stop domestic violence. Well, that is a question I feel strongly about. And I think in the, with all the budget crises that we've felt in the last few years that people have stepped away from the kind of leadership we ought to be taking in that area, and whether that domestic violence involves a household, whether it involves community violence, as we saw in today's paper with, uh, with gay and lesbian members of our community, where violence happens, we need to step back and find out the sources of that anger and the sense that you have any right to harm anyone, to raise a hand against anyone. I don't think we do a very good job of it. It's happening now in some high schools and even in some elementary schools where they're beginning to talk about hatred and about discrimination. But I think that we many times raise generations of people into adulthood who grow up believing it is all right to raise a fist against another. We must stop that. Hands were not meant for hitting, and we must make that case. Ted Kay, City Club member. Governor Roberts says you worked on your autobiography and looked on your years as governor. I'm wondering, knowing what you know now, what might you have done different during your governorship? Uh, perhaps worked harder to defeat Measure 5, I don't know. <laughs> but looking back, there are not many things I would change about my time as governor. It's not to say I did it perfectly, but I did it with heart and soul and strong ethics, which matter all three of those things to me. I think if I had to go back and re-examine my attempt to correct Oregon's tax structure and bring it up to date, I would have worked more solidly with the Oregon legislature to get them to take that measure and refer it to the ballot. We lost by two votes of a referral to the ballot. I think it might have been the perfect time 
for us to restructure our tax system, which has not been restructured since and is one of the hardest issues a governor faces in trying to, to deal with that issue in today's social and political climate. So I think I would go back and re-examine how I worked with the legislature to see if I could have made that happen. And uh, that's a regret. I think I refer to it in my book as the greatest political failure of my career. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time for further questions and we'll have to stop for today. Please join us next week for City Club's 2011 legislative wrap up with House co-chairs Arnie Roblin and Bruce Hanna. I do want to point out that those of you who are in the room may want to check out the Oregon Historical Society on display in the corner. Uh, there are many wonderful things there for you to investigate relative to our talk today. As we close, please join me in expressing our deep appreciation to Governor Barbara Roberts, who brought her heart and soul and ethics to our podium today. And we are adjourned. <laughs>